CFAX 1070. Good morning. The University of Victoria has marked a major milestone this month with the appointment of Gundok, Dr. Jackie Green of the Heisler First Nation as the first Indigenous Director of UVic's School of Social Work. She is also the first Indigenous Director of any mainstream post-secondary social work program in Canada. She joins me this morning. Good morning, Jackie. Good morning. Thanks for being on the program. And uh, You're welcome. congratulations on your new appointment. How exciting is that? It's very exciting. Thank you. Uh, why does this mean so much to First Nation people? Um, I, as I think it's an uh, untold history. It's um, not very spoken about or it is spoken about, but not in a good light in terms of social work or child welfare. Um, our children and families and communities are in the news for not very um, nice things, uh, very negative. Um, the system continues to harm our people, and so taking on leadership roles such as this, um, I think provides uh, a different vision for our people and our children and communities. Mm -hmm. And especially in the area uh, of social work. Yes. Uh, how, how do the numbers work here when we look at how many first nations kids require the services of a social worker it's very high um, it's and it's very sad uh, it, we all often talk about um, historical statistics such as the 60 scoop and residential school um, and um, I bring that forward because then we talk about policy changes and legislation however today 2013 we have a really high it's higher than a 60 scoop of our children in care of the state. Um, so um, even though there has been policy shifts, um, it hasn't been beneficial for our children and our families. I think we need to flesh this one out because I, I, that that's really shocking. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the 60s scoop. Define that for us. The 60s scoop was, uh, it was in the 50s when the provincial um, government was give, granted permission to um, uh, provide services to on-reserve communities. Um, and since they went on to the reserve, there was a high number of children that were removed from the communities based on um, how they saw families needed to live. So to back that up further, um, prior to that, a number of our children were legally forced into residential schools. Their parents were going to be punished if they didn't send their kids to the school. So these kids who went to residential schools removed were, were returned to their communities, and because of they were they were abused so violently, they didn't really know how to parent their own children. So these children, in return, were taken away from the government. <laughs> So, I mean, there has been an apology to um, reconcile that, but there has really been no reconciliation yet. Um, I don't really believe that there is something that can reconcile the, the violence that happened to our people. What we have done, however, is try to shift policies and practices that will pay better attention to uh, Indigenous families and communities so that we have a bit more autonomy over the welfare and uh, the caring and love for our children in a way that's reflective of our own cultural values. However, those haven't really played out to the best of its ability yet, so I think that's why. I think there's also a fear on the government side. Um, there's a lot of um, child deaths. There's a lot of um, other forms of violence that happen. So. To me, it feels like out of fear, we tend to remove rather than provide um, prevention work for our children and families. Before we move on uh, any more to that, I, I'd like to get your reaction to the revelation that First Nations children, uh, some here on Vancouver Island, were used in experiments, that they were starved uh, in order to uh, be experimented on. What's happening in your community in terms of reaction to that? Obviously, um, a, a part of, of the legacy of the residential school system. It's very disgusting, and it's um, Canada should be ashamed of itself um, that it, you know, this leaked out. Um, I'm on a listserv with um, Aboriginal faculty from across Canada, and this is a big discussion on the listserv. Is um, what other um, what other violence are they hiding? Um, 
um, and I think that it's it's really harmful um, for me personally hearing the news. Um, I I just don't want to speak about it to my family who have attended residential school. Why would I cause more harm to that? So for me personally, um, it's it's very they're already traumatized um, through the Truth and Reconciliation where they came forward with their stories. Um, there was the funds that were distributed to people and families and. It's just very traumatizing and it's digging up all of this, but I think that as academics and as leaders in our generation, we can make those changes and we can confront those injustices. And I think that collectively that we need, that we can do it effectively. I, n I don't only mean with Indigenous people, but with non-Indigenous people as well, that we can confront this injustice that has happened to our parents. Mm -hmm. And it, it does shed, uh, I guess, an even brighter light mm -hmm. on, on what went on. Uh, let's bring Joan into the conversation. Good morning, Joan. You're on CFAX. Uh, yes. I... Um would like I, it doesn't seem to me that anybody is bringing up the discussion or the facts of these children being put in residential schools. Um, I lived close to them when I was growing up years ago. And uh, what were the conditions on the reserves? Did they have schools there? Did they have medical treatment? Did they have access to learning? And um, what this business of experimenting with the children? I mean, those kids came malnourished to the schools, and they were trying to help them, and they weren't experimenting on them. Vitamins in those days were a new thing, and now this woman's talking about uh, one of the chiefs about how they had to take cod liver oil. Well, I don't think there's very few people in this country that are over 40 or 50 years old that didn't get cod liver oil. Well, you know, Joan, I think it, 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 uh, it was much more extensive than that. Um, Jackie, if, if you could um, uh, jump in here uh, sure. and uh, explain to Joan uh, just what did go on in terms of uh, malnourishment. Sure. Well, first, the creation of the reserve uh, is intentionally done by the government to keep Indigenous people, First Nations people, away from a growing economy. Um, the reserves were created to confine our people historically, so they weren't allowed to leave the reserve. Um, in fact, um, in my father's lifetime, he had to get permission from Indian agents before he can leave. It was illegal for our people to be in the town side. It was illegal for our people to leave the reserve. So the reserve system was created to confine First Nations people. But Canada doesn't know that story. <laughs> And it was also illegal if our if the families wanted to keep the children home and nurture them and teach them and um, create a, a healthy living and educational time for them. It was illegal for them to do that. And if they, but it was illegal so that so that Joan is clear on this one that that yeah. it was illegal to educate children yes, on, yeah, on reserves. It, it was illegal for um, First Nations children to go past grade 8 or grade 10. If you wanted to get a post-secondary student, you have to forego a status that the uh, government put on each First Nations person. So there's a lot more to your question around um, the schools were intended to help children. It was intended to nurture them and educate them. Um, it was actually forced. So just like any Canadian citizen or any any citizen around the world, you want to have that ability to choose where you want to go to school. In the case of First Nations people, there was no choice, and it was made law so that our children can attend those schools and not ever see their parents, um, that ever, not ever see their families, and um, a lot of those children actually did starve, and they died in those residential schools. So that story is untold. Um, uh, what to do you make of, of Joan's assertion that... Um that there wasn't uh, sort of systematic uh, denial of food for experimentation purposes. I guess I'm curious of where that information came from. I'm sure there probably were some people that were nice. <laughs> um, there are very few of that. We hear that quite a bit where there was good intentions. 
um, um, as a director and as a faculty person, I'll just speak as a faculty person, we have that conversation in a classroom all the time around what are good intentions. I'm actually here to help you. And so we problematize that because good intentions could be from a mainstream perspective or from a government perspective. I, I don't know how... how um Starving kids would, would be a, a good intention. It's not. It's not, a, it's not a good intention, but from what I get from the question is that there was, um, there was no bad intentions in those right. experiments. That was what I was getting at. Right. Let's bring Todd in. Hi, you're on CFAX 1070. Todd? Oh, hi. How are you? I'm well. Thank you. Good, good. I just wanted to, first of all, congratulate uh, Jackie on her role as the, uh, the new uh, director. I understand it's the first, she's the first Indigenous director in Canada. That's correct. And I wanted to just ask Jackie, I know that um, I've read many of your articles, and I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are about delegated Indigenous child welfare agencies and whether they're a step in the right direction or not. Thank you, Todd. Um, well, I think when delegations um, first came into, um, when it was first developed, it uh, was a... Jackie, if we could just explain to people what delegation okay. is here. Delegated we ha in Canada, or I'll speak particularly to British Columbia, we have um, delegated child welfare agencies that are specific to um, Aboriginal people, whether they're urban or whether they're on First Nations. And there's a whole formula that um, the communities have to abide by in order to have a delegated agencies. And the intention was to have more autonomy to um, deliver social services to Indigenous people, families and communities that is reflective of our own cultural values and cultural teachings. Um, and the intention in the early years was that this is a stepping stone and the thought back then is that um, we need to have our own legislation so that we can provide the laws and the policies and practice that would better reflect Indigenous families and communities. We haven't gotten to the stage yet where um, we can have our own legislation. It's an ongoing conversation. There is um, a lot of different key players that need to be a part of those conversations. Um, and I, I, I think that we still need to move forward and beyond delegation. Right now, right now, delegated agencies are delegated by the government, and so we still follow the mandates and the, the legislation of the government. So, in that sense, it still guides us to remove children. But on the other sense, we can do work in a different way that's reflective of our different communities. We are talking to Gundope, Dr. Jackie Green, uh, from the School of Social Work. Uh, major milestone here uh, this month. She has been appointed uh, as the first Indigenous Director of UVic's School of Social Work, and we'll have more with her right after this. The University of Victoria marking a major milestone this month, appointing Gundope, Dr. Jackie Green of the Heisla First Nation, as the first Indigenous Director of UVic's School of Social Work. She's also the first Indigenous director of any mainstream post-secondary social work program in the country. Dr. Green, when it comes to removal of First Nations children's, uh, children from their homes, get us up to speed on what's going on today. You said that it's higher than the, the scoop back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, I, in my recent conversations with um, different um, working with MCFD and uh, different engagements I have with um, delegated agencies and community members. I'm also a project manager for Indigenous Child Wellbeing Research Network, and so we would do a lot of work within our communities. And so there is a lot of conversation around how the, how the policies around removal needs to improve and, and the practices need to improve. The conversations that we have at the community level when we're doing our training is that a lot of times it's not necessarily the policy but the behavior or the attitude or the fear of the workers that are involved. So, you know, because... Um, child welfare or social work is always in the media, not in a good light, but because there's been either a child death or there's been violence in the home, mm -hmm. um, it's, um, there's a lot of fear in practice. And so what we want to do is talk about how do we network good practices? How do we network and share what's working? 
Um, and an example I'll share with you is um, in our work that we've done as a research network, we've connected up with um, La Quilam's community, which is Port Simpson in northern BC. And uh, they've created what's called what they call the Grannies Club. Now these grannies um, were were grannies who attended residential school, and when they became parents, their children were either removed or they didn't have a good relationship with them. So since they've become grannies, they've found their way back to healing and nurturing, and they're they're remembering cultural knowledge and they're they're being leaders in teaching that. So what the Grannies Club does is they work with the local school and they work with their local um, delegated child welfare agency and they provide guidance as to what practice can look like. So what we do is we network those kind of approaches um, so that it's a community, a collective community that are raising the children, like how it used to be before. And how would uh, that impact uh, the rate of removal of, of First Nations children from their homes if a social worker deems it to be a dangerous situation for the child? Yeah, well, the, the part of what the Grannies Club do is they share that parenting. So they share um, if there's a problem going on with the family and there there is potential removal, the Grannies Club would step in and, and help the parents to, you know, address the issue or they would take the child, the child will still remain with the community and with the family so that they're not put into the system and it's difficult for them to come back home. And that model has been effective. Um, they've actually been contacted by other communities around that approach. It brings it back to community caring for children. Um, another example of that is uh, we worked with Port Hardy, and so they've got a, a grandparents club. So they're the ones that are responsible for advocating for children. They actually go right into the courtrooms and advocate to judges that this child needs to stay in our community, and they share with them who's going to look after the child. This is these are the services that are in place, and it's guided by them, not by you know, necessarily the government to say your child is going to come here. So in that sense, it provides more autonomy to the community to care for their children. Mm -hmm. Sounds proactive too. Um, it is, yeah. When it comes to training and hiring First Nations social workers, uh, is that going on now? How many are in the system or do you identify a need for that? It's growing. Um, the, with the delegated agency, there is a high. Um, so each agency, um, I believe that they have about 80 to 90 percent of their own people that are working within those agencies. And um, most of those people that are working there either have a BSW or an MSW. Um, there is so a bachelor of social work, masters of social work. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so also there is room for um, agencies to hire elders or community healers to be a part of it. Um, so there, there, it is on the rise. Um, there is still, um, so when we developed this, the Indigenous Specialization here at the school in 2000, um, Kual Simat, my colleague, Rabina, and I, we did some research around that. And basically the community was telling us that when we educate um, social work students to get a to get their BSW. We need to make sure that they have the historical content, meaning understanding colonization, residential school, and all of that trauma by the state. But we also need to include a healing component, a strengthening component. So what we do is we bring in ceremony, we bring in cultural knowledge, we bring in indigenous healers and helpers um, into the curriculum. Um, and now there are other instructors in our program, um, such as um, Todd Ormiston, who called in 451, and we have um, 354, which is an introduction, and all students take that. They actually attend ceremonies, so they, they get to experience um, what that's about. So we're trying to bring in a lot of Indigenous, not trying, but we are bringing in a lot of Indigenous culture, knowledge, and ceremony into our curriculum. And students at least get to experience it. They may never want to participate in it again, but at least they'll have knowledge to respect this is another form of practice that's relevant to social work, especially when there's a high number of our kids in care. Remind us of that number uh, compared to the rest of the population. The rest of the population, it, it varies throughout the province. So um, in Victoria, I believe we have about up to 40 percent 
um, in the north we can have almost 70% of our kids in care of the state. So it varies from region to region on what those numbers look like. It sounds like there's a great need to have you at the helm. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, especially given the numbers, um, which are quite stark in terms of just how many First Nations kids are in there. Uh, and obviously a move that's been underway for, for some time to have uh, First Nations children stay uh, in their communities. Are you seeing that happening with the, the Grannies program sufficiently that we might see uh, the situation reverse, say, in, in the next decade? Where yeah. yeah. You think that's possible? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think it is. I think that um, because of um, what's happened to our people nationwide and even globally where um, we've been, our people have been systemically and legally confined, that we're in an era now where there are a number of people who are pursuing post-secondary. There are a number of Indigenous academic programs so that it's balanced through Western education and Indigenous knowledge. Um, so there were our people are having more autonomy within our communities, and our people are in positions now to create policies and practices that are relevant to each of our own communities. Um, and and it's I think it's a good thing. One of the challenges that I've seen in different um, the college and the university in terms of hiring people is that. Um, you know, sometimes we're having to figure out, okay, who are we going to hire? There are so many qualified people now, and I, I just keep telling my colleagues that's a good problem to have <laughs> rather than when we first started the specialization in 2000, um, the school had to create changes so that it gave us time to finish our master's and our PhD so that we can be in an academic. Nowadays, people are coming to um, interviews that have all of those credentials. So there's a really big increase in um, Indigenous people attaining post-secondary education and coming with very good cultural knowledge. Um, and in that, we're able to develop um, agencies, communities, and um, you know practices that are relevant. And also to be able to answer back to state um, the, meaning the government, we're able to say to the government, this is what works best for our people. We need to accommodate that. And, and it's happening now. So, Because you've spent a lot of time at school. What was it like getting your PhD? It was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was also exciting work. Um, the when I finished, when I pressed the send button to um, submit my dissertation, what resonated for me was um, I grew up not knowing Haisla way of life and laws, where I'm from. And the reason why I didn't learn is because my parents said when they were in residential school, they were they were punished because they they were speaking the language and they knew Haisla Nuyam. So when they had their children, they didn't want us to learn because they feared that I would get punished. And you and were I, punished and you were able to get your PhD. I and I, I thank you so much for coming on the program today. We'll have you back on. Thank you. We've been talking to Gundo, Dr. Jackie Green of the Heisler First Nation. She's the first Indigenous Director of UVic School of Social Work.